Williams are both on the capitation committee, and uh, you know he's always one step ahead of everybody else, so he's a good person to follow. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Kelly. Thank you. Before I actually get into the lecture, how many people here have heard me before? Hello? Have heard me before? Is this my cloud now? We're working on it. Oh, Sorry. That speaker is loud. How many are actually doing cavitational surgery every year? Besides the Marcos. <laughs> I listen. You listen. I listen to you first. Oh. <laughs> Okay, well, today's talk is going to cover the, the diagnosis and how you get to having a good diagnosis or capitation. What instrumentation is necessary to do the surgery itself? First part will be very detailed as to the trigeminal neuralgia, the clinical instrumentation, and the radiometrics, etc. And there's one example of a simple surgical procedure. The second example would be three clinical cases that are some more difficult than others. And I'm not going to repeat the trigeminal system and all the mechanics that are still quiet. And so when you're in, I'm not sure we have plenty of them. Um, is the information from this Part of the and some of the mm -hmm. no, we'll the we'll not getting, the mic's not working in here. I don't know it's something to do with all his stuff that he's hooked up here. Uh, the instrumentation mm -hmm. no, it's oh, all his stuff. It's his stuff that he's he's got to turn it on. I don't know how to do it. By the best instrument you can get. Personally, the instrument holds up very well. I try to set a shot and it just didn't feel right. It's almost like holding a pencil instead of an instrument. So I suggest only the best if you're going to do the work. So we're going to start with talking about the trigeminal system. And we're going to talk about a typical trigeminal neuralgia, which is usually intracranial. And it involves aneurysms and things like that. And we're going to talk about the atypical which most candidates fall into. Third is atypical facial pain, which involves toothaches, headaches, etc. I'm not going to cover that in this lecture. Tictalaru is another name for typical trigeminal neuralgia, where you actually have a trigger point that you touch on the outside of someone's face. Does anybody here have a patient with that kind of complication? And the way to treat that will be spoken uh, in a little bit. So after you discover what the patient's problem is, you want to know the etiology, you want to figure out where it's coming from. And idiopathic, which is going to be a word used a little bit today, uh, which is an unknown source of the problem. But pulpal inflammation, where does it come from? The infection. Removal of pulp tissue, and then the muscles, the presentation, and the coat, and the nervous system. We have volume. It's not right. All falls into the typical trigeminal neuralgia. These guys are checking. Symptomatology is usually caused by tumor, hunting artery, multiple sclerosis, cerebral and vascular problem. In the thing that most of us forget is that when the information goes into the gastric ganglion and it goes back to the brain stem, there's actually layers that it goes through the governance of the governing system that prevents. So it's the failure of that preventive system to allow all that information moving up to the brain. So it's like a car without brakes. The patient gets to the point where the trigeminal system is a car without brakes, they don't have control anymore and they're having a lot of pain. The uh, symptoms are uh, extreme lancing pain which lasts two to three minutes. It's sharp and burning. A lot of people think that somebody put a 
wired to them. It's usually unilateral, and it affects people usually in the 40s and 50s, and has a very strong. Uh, Bless you. <laughs> can you hear me now? Anyway, can you hear me back there without the light? No. Okay. Well, it affects 40s and 50s roles, and here's the female. And the treatment of the external trigger points are candidates that's missing in there by the things. We even have the salary uh, the division, but I haven't seen them like that. There's mostly mandibular and maxillary divisions. And Usually it's only the sensory part and not the motor part that's affected. But remember that the trigeminal system only has a mandibular branch for the muscles and the control, so efferent. The uh, refractory uh, period that takes place. So after you touch a person and they fire off and they have their pain, then there's a period that takes place, 15, 20 minutes, called a refractory period. During that period, those people stop and eat because they don't have any other time to do it. If they try to eat while they're, they're still having a problem where the trigger point is active, then those individuals will actually stop eating and put on a face that you can't believe. So they have that 15 minute window. Now what's happened over the years of having that problem, even though they're being treated, is that the medication stopped working and that refractory period gets shorter and shorter and shorter. You can use Tegretol, Baclofen, Clinopin, and Neurontin. Each of them have their own unique complications, so, but they're, they're central nervous system uh, depressors. I suggest that before you prescribe that for a patient, you make sure that you understand the ramifications and follow the patient very closely. Don't just write a script and have the patient go out and, and not come back for a month or two. It's very important that you follow these people and you can raise or lower the amount of medication based on the clinical symptoms. Although there can be complications, especially from the Rontan, where their feet get cold and uh, they're having a shutdown like an RSD effect. Typical trigeminal neuralgia, we're gonna, we have main means of treating it uh, surgically. There's the microvascular decompression, the precutaneous radiofrequency thermoneurolysing, which is actually heating the nerve up. Um, there's bloom compression, which I'm on the airplane studying this, and a girl came over to me and said, my husband had bloom compression, and now he's miserable. I mean, what are you supposed to say to somebody standing in the aisle of the airplane asking you a question like that, and here I have this information up? I said, here's my card. You live in Florida. Call me. But uh, neural uh, lysing injections and a gamma knife. And today they're using a proton also, a proton uh, generator to treat lesions intracranially. This represents the, yes. That's why it's not in our handout, so could you put it back again? Oh, I'm sorry. It's not in handout? Or I, okay, well, as I, I have to explain that they wanted this at the beginning of August. And as I was working through this, I kept, oh, I, I, I gotta tell them about that. I gotta tell them about that. So um, I can bring it up to date uh, and compare it, and then anybody that wants, Anything else, let me know, and we'll make sure you get it. Everybody ready? Thanks, Blanche. Well, this represents a decompression technique going through the mastoid area of the, of the skull. And what it is, is the surgeon is placing a Teflon-coated piece between the nerve and the blood vessel. And because of the pulsing of the blood vessel on a regular basis, the nerve became overstimulated. And you get the white matter overstimulated, the brakes go off, and the patient is experiencing pain, uh, and it's a constant throbbing effect. The radio frequency um, generator, the cannula is being placed in the foramen ovale. And after it's placed up in there, you have a choice of bringing the electrode 
up, middle, and down, depending on what part of the Gasserian ganglion you want to cause uh, the C fibers to be destroyed. It's 110 degrees for three minutes. Obviously, most dentists don't do this in their office. But it's nice to know what the neurosurgeon might do to the patient if we can't find the problem. And a lot of patients that come in have already had some of the surgeries. That's why I'm showing this. And it turns out to be a neuralgia-inducing cavitational osteonecrosis. This is the balloon com uh, compression technique where you're actually causing ischemia leading to necrosis. And the neurolysis with uh, anhydrous glycerol. This technique is not, in my opinion, very good. It allows the spreading of the fluid through the area. And everything it touches will, will be destroyed. So. This represents the gamma knife. All the beam will, will be focused on the lesion inside the intracranial area. And the patient's actually placed on a um, table and wheeled underneath this head hat, so to speak, and then the gamma rays are uh, projected to it. Now, it'll travel through each of the tissues, but it will culminate in one area that they've chosen based on the CAT scans and the MRIs and destroy the lesion. So this is a non-invasive procedure. Uh, the prot uh, proton generator does the same thing, only a patient is suspended in space. University of Gainesville at the J. Hillis Miller, Miller Center has one of these. So Henry Gramillion has access to that apparatus. Let's talk a little bit about atypical trigeminal neuralgia, which we can have as a pre-trigeminal neuralgia, because it's more localized usually, from crushing or transition, transecting. Um, and it also, most of the neuralgia-inducing cavitational osteonecrotic lesions are in this area because they're more local. But as you'll see, everything is related. The symptoms are constant instead of being intermittent. And it's unilateral, usually, and a trigger point, and it's usually an intraoral trigger point. The treatment, though, I use the anesthetic and therapeutic injections like procaine to actually reset ganglions, uh, the sphenopalatine, submandibular ganglion. And when I inject those, a lot of times I'll wash out mercury or other toxins that are present, and the patient restore, it gets restored. And the pain goes away, and the complications are gone. So there's an opportunity there, if you're good at the injections, to place 1% procaine to allow the ganglion to reset itself. Um, medication, we talked about the medications are the same, the Tegretol, Neurontin, and infrared. Uh, we can use an 810 laser, 400 uh, milliamps, also to reset the ganglions. Not as effective as the injections. The injections are, I would say, 10 times more effective, but you really got to hit the ganglion on the head. You can't, you can't miss. These are actually, you're dealing with uh, autonomic nervous system and uh, remember that this trigeminal system is actually a parasympathetic. And you're the sympathetic windup causes an RSD, which causes blood vessels to shut down. And we'll get into that a little bit. Ozone. Well, we're fortunate enough to have Phil here representing the people that teach the ozone. They told me this morning they've taught over 200 individuals and how to use the ozone. I am not familiar with it, and I'm hearing good things. I'm looking forward to the papers coming out so that we can incorporate it into our means so we don't have to go in and do the more open surgeries that we've been doing. And of course, you can use the radio frequency lysing to go into, let's say, the uh, maxillary division here through the infraorbital foramen uh, this is a picture of Wes Shanklin actually doing the procedure. And 
and actually causing that nerve to to uh, abate itself and be destroyed from the from a sensory standpoint. So the patient had a trigger point right by the nose, and he's using this to abate that. So what's the most important thing you can leave here with? One that you have to use your anesthetics responsibly. You could do nerve blocks. For example, if the maxillary area, the patient's having pain, and you suspect you have a lot of, um, a lot of information showing that's the mandibular, but the patient's still pointing to the maxilla, give the patient an inferior alveolar block, an Ashkenazi block, and see if the pain goes away. If the pain in the maxillary, maxillary area goes away because you block the mandible, then it raises my suspicion that it's the mandible and not the maxilla that the problem is in. So try to localize using anesthesia. We had a case the other day that even though we gave all the blocks and everything else, two molars, 31 and 32, wouldn't get numb. And I had to use an X uh, tip in order to numb them up. And then when I ran a cavitat analysis, the patient had a, a cavitation there, which did not show on the x-ray, in my opinion. But I became suspicious because the anesthetic worked in the bicuspid area and in the uh, cuspid area, but did not work in the molar area. So using the x uh, tip, putting the anesthesia directly into the lesion, the patient was totally numb. The teeth were extracted. They were root canal involved. Results of Im imaging is very important. Panos, CAT scans, MRIs. Wes uses a STIR MRI, which well, uh, they take the, the X-ray, I mean the MRI, and they, they bend the beam. And when they, they bend it, you get a black hole. You can see the black holes in the, in the MRIs. He has uh, Rick up there doing a wonderful job. Uh, doing that for him. I have only one technician in the area that will do that for me. The other thing is a good history. Now, I put it in red because it's probably the most important thing. Sit down, leave a lot of time for these patients, and listen to their story. They have a lot to say. They've been to five or six or ten doctors or whatever, and they have all the little stories will help you take apart and figure out what's going on. But if you go right in there, you say, oh, that's cavitation. I don't have to listen anymore. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's toxicity of the bone. We don't know. I had another patient the other day. It turned out to be toluene. Toluene is a methyl benzene that contaminated her bone because she was painting furniture. After she finished painting without wearing a mask from these spray, Crayola sprays or whatever, she inhaled all that. and For two months, she was sick. She doesn't think anything of it, but now it's 15 months later, 11 root canals, all the teeth extracted, and still having the same problem. So my diagnosis was chemical toxicity, toluene. I have a physician working on getting it out of her system and out, and then I will handle. There's actually no cavitations, but the patient has um, osteomyelitis and osteonecrosis. So we're talking to her about rebuilding the bone, putting back the alveolus, which is almost impossible in some areas, that are completely, um, I have pictures that an endodontist opened up to do a um, apicals, and the bone's dead. It's almost brown. In some areas, ebony white. So now we have to figure out, what can you do for this individual who's now a dental cripple? And if you take all that dead bone away, She's not going to have anything to build on. But what are you going to do? So you have to take that into consideration. So let's get into a little bit of the osseous necrosis while we're all here. And first, in 1794, this was brought in the literature. That is there, is it not? Isn't that in your paperwork? No. All right. Well, I apologize. All this was sent. but. Um, I'll make sure this part of the lecture or the whole lecture, well, actually, everybody's going to get a, um, a DVD of, of everything that's here. But if you want anything, you can call me. The information on my number is right here. 
we've just moved, but uh, the phone numbers are the same. You can reach me. And if you want my cell number, it's 954 224 1611. And either leave a message or you'll get me directly, and I'll try to answer any questions you may have. Well, the other guy was extension prevention, uh, G.V. Black, and I'm sure everybody, some of the guys here remember him. Um, and he said, extend the amalgam preparations as long as wide as you can to prevent caries. Now, you've got to remember when he said it, but he's also credited for chronic osteitis, and he called them cell-by-cell -cell death causing cavities in the bone. But note that there's no swelling and there's no temperature rise, and there's no redness. Now, that's important to, to see the difference. And later, you'll see some other ramifications. Radna and Roberts, oral surgeons, put the information in the journal in 79. Um, he's an oral surgeon in the Bronx. I think he still wears a six gun when he, when he goes to see the patient underneath his gown. He's eccentric. But he's a very interesting guy. He wrote the paper, and I really enjoyed it. Jerry Bacot, I think we all know, he coined the phrase neuralgia-inducing cavitational osteonecrosis. And currently, he has over 10,000 pathology slides representing neuralgia-inducing cavitational osteonecrosis. I know three people here that have sent them quite a few. And sometimes I even send it up to the University of Florida, Cone, who's a pretty good pathologist, too, just to get a, another reading. And the two of them usually coordinate and, and say the same thing. In the Journal of uh, Odin Laryngology, there was a paper in Stockholm, 1979, on uh, diff uh, diffuse grossing osteomyelitis, just to show you that the medical group knows it better than us. And of course, the chronic sclerosing osteomyelitis was in the radiology journal in 77, also in Stockholm. So the ADA is not involved with them. Physical trauma is one of the reasons that we have neuralgia-inducing cavitational osteonecrosis, because with physical trauma, you can get an increase in pressure, not allowing any fresh blood to come in and oxygen to the bone, and the bone dies. And it goes through this whole sequence of hypoxia, ischemia, necrosis. Bacterial trauma. Now, everyone here has seen periodontal cases that are severe. And the severe periodontal cases will have bacteria in the, in the bone. It will travel. And if you've ever seen a slide of a tooth um, with all the adenastomosis and all the blood vessels going to it, it's not isolated by a long shot. And our mandible and maxilla are right there next to, to absorb all those bacteria. Just like mercury moves freely through the tissue, the bacteria, if you take a, a live blood cell study, you see the bacteria being chased by the white blood cells. It's a war that's going on all the time. We're not sterile inside. So this is a artist rendition of a uh, neuralgia-inducing cavitational osteonecrosis. You'll notice that there's a fistula here, and patients experience a bad taste, and it comes and goes. And the fistula usually vents itself on the lingual. Now, not too many of us are going to notice it on the tongue all the way down in the mandible on the lingual. But that's usually where the problem is when the fistula is open. And in here, about 13% of the cases of the osteonecrosis material has an anti-myelin feature to it that uh, uh, Mannheim, uh, uh, is it Mannheim? It was um, Bob, I think it was Bob Mannheim that, that said it in 94. And so the actual, you notice the myelin sheath is gone, but the tooth is vital. And the patient's having pain, and I attribute it to it's like stripping the wire off of, of a uh, light uh, 
of a uh, wire that goes to a light bulb, and the next thing you know, it shorts out. So we have a secondary formation taking place. Now, this is an actual slide, I mean an actual biopsy that uh, anatomy stripped down by Wes Shanklin. And what he had, here's your inferior alveolar nerve. Here's the lesion area. And here I believe a molar had been extracted. And here's a bicuspid. So you're looking at, this is a fresh cadaver. So I believe this person is the one that passed away. She killed herself and willed her head to Wes Shanklin to do this autopsy. I guess it's the right word at this point. And, and here we have the reason why she had so much pain. Well, it's not uncommon to have the dryness. These two gentlemen, Young and Shin, in California, um, took these pictures, and you could see how everything dries out and how it becomes fray, the actual pictures, the drawings. But what am I pointing out? I'm pointing out that the nerve goes through the mandible and the maxilla. And then when there's a lesion in there, it involves the nerve. And it's the most, it has a lot of sensory feedback. The other thing we need to point out is every time you cut a tooth, every time you cut the periodontium, every time you involve the trigeminal system in the Gesserian ganglia, the first, gang, the first synapse, where the cell body lies, because these are dendrites that are coming out to the system, they die. How many of these have to die before a patient starts having complications? Is that why a patient of 40 or 50 winds up is more prevalent to have trigeminal neuralgia than a young person? And of course, this points out the trigeminal system, the gesserian ganglion, foramen ovale, foramen rotunda. But notice that 85% of the headaches and neuralgias are all involving the maxillofacial area. And at 40% of the input to the brain from sensory is from the trigeminal system. We really have a big responsibility as dentists. We're in there every day. So the, the three branches all lead to the Gesserian ganglion, which is the first synapse. A patient drew this. I borrowed this from Jerry Boko, uh, and this is from in his book. This is the patient's rendition of how she felt from the problem. But more importantly, let's pay attention to the symptoms. Deep bone aching, sharp non-lancing, lancing, intraosseous pressure, milo, uh, per, um, per, uh, milo per porosis. That's the sensation of heat, not the heat itself. There is no heat. And pressure sensation, I agree with. There, there is a pressure sensation. But look where it refers. And a lot of times, the patient will come in and say their chest is burning right here. Because right under the clavicle, it refers to when it's the mandible involved, usually. And so we need to distinguish that. The patients are crazy because the symptoms don't meet the amount of disease that you see. The patients are crazy because it moves from side to side and it's not supposed to go to left to the right and, and different times. And it's a multifactorial, and the patients are not able to localize it. So what's the first thing you think of when you talk to this patient, you listen to them? You think, well, maybe they want drugs, or they're not, they're not quite there. Well, they've reached this point where they're not quite there. And you have to give them a lot of credit for even pursuing and keep pursuing to try to get well. Well, I'm sorry. You have neuropathy and you have neuritis. And neuropathy is defined as the peripheral dying of a nerve. And neuritis is defined as nerve inflammation. Now, John Beck and Jerry Bacow spoke about this at length. But Beck really carried it to its finest at the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain here in Las Vegas 
uh, at the Paris in 02. And he talks about RSD of the trigeminal nerve, reflex dystrophy. So you have a sympathetic shift that takes place. And he actually has a neurological test to determine that with a, what they call a parachute test. And so you could take each patient and go through the actual testing using neurology to see if the patient has a trigeminal sympathetic component. And if they do, they're moving from a level of normal to a level of abnormal or pre, pre-normal. Because as we grow, the nerves change and they mature. And what will happen is the nerve will revert back to its more primitive <coughs> function when it has a system that's churning down. So the trigeminal system will shut down in the general body system just by causing an RSD. And the brain will protect the system. The limbs will start to lose the brain. And the brain will protect what's necessary to protect the brain. Now that's an extreme. When RSD gets to a certain point, then there's no turning it around, so I understand. But if you get it early, and you figure out what's going on, and what he does, he, when there is an RSD, or when there's a change in the, in the trigeminal system, he uses it as a tool. And he actually places the rafat in the mouth of the patient. We're getting a little bit of rest from hospital process, but by doing that, and then testing the reflex, and the reflex comes back, he knows that changing the, the uh, dimension made a difference in the trigeminal system went back to normal. These are all closed patients. The other thing he could do, and we do, is you inject the nerve itself. You inject it, you infer on the nerve, and the reflex comes back. And the reflex comes back on his things to do. Then you know that that's the problem area that's that's being focused on the moment. So there are tools here to figure out what's going on with that invading the patient. So this is the famous cat attack or approved on ultrasound. Uh, it is FDA approved and there's a lot of controversy with certain insurance companies over it. I find it to be 95% effective. When you couple this with a pattern or a tomo or a CAT scan, uh, it is very fine analysis of what's happening. The problem, I think, with it is it's too limited to the little squares. And you, uh, you, you, you'll see what I mean. You have a generator that puts out 2.5 megahertz vibrations at 1,042 feet per second. It's three football fields. And you have a receiver on the other side. Now when that ultrasound goes through the bone, if there's fluid there, it will travel at 1,042 feet per second. If there's, a, if there's a dry spot, it will slow down. Milli, millisecond change. But the equipment, the Cavitat 4000, and I understand a new generation now, will give you information right here. Everybody see that right in the back? <coughs> and this shows you where the cavitation is, or how areas are in the bone. So if there was an infection in the bone, what would you see? You'd see green because this is an accident. It's just the opposite. And so if the information travels through the bone slowly, then it shows up red, meaning there's a, there's a fluid there. But if there's fluid there and inflammation, then you may have green. So it's just the opposite of what you usually think. This is this is a tool. Thank you. It's coming. It's coming, huh? Thank you by next lecture. All right. We have we're fortunate enough to have a tomograph and uh, a pre-op stone uh, in the office. We use it for the T and J. We use it for this uh, applications.
the list of instruments and these instruments that you have, these are my favorite ones, everybody has their own. You pick and choose and put them together and put them in a tray and have two, three sets and they're all, all set. I think the hardest thing is to keep them sharp. They really need a little hand on those strings. This is set by Steve Evans and Brad Phillips from Schumann. I don't, know, I don't know what they cost today, but they're very special, including this to move the inferior millimeter out of the way without injuring it. And then you can work around it. It was a little bit easy. You can actually move the nerve. Now, after we move the nerve out of the way, we wrap it in collagen and we put it back in place. Then we pack our bone around it, as you'll see. We use the freeze dry. Bone. It's an allograph. It's human. We don't believe in, in, in using the bovin. And it comes in two sizes. It has acid tracing in it. And the uh, column makes it big. And we actually add to it tetracycline. We use a quarter of a capsule of tetracycline in the mix. And you'll see how we mix it together, sometimes using plasma rich platelets or just by itself and makes everything good. We use a collar plugs, which you'll see on the first case, and it helps fill in the area. And we use the biogram, which is a membrane. And it actually takes uh, anywhere from, we have some of them that we destroy in 120 days, and it's going to go 180 times. These are about like six weeks. And we're using a lot of the Gen 21S, which is a growth factor. We don't need any uh, generating membrane, and we don't. We, we do mix it with bone, the freeze dried bone, allograph, and we place it in, and we put tissue right in the pillow. We have to give them closure. <coughs> and it works very well, but it's very expensive. It's $300. What do you have to do? The collagen. It's like you know, like the table, collagen. So that when we pack bone around it, we don't actually put the bone in the And then we'll be prey on it. I suggest this over everything else. We don't even need a PRP with this, usually. But it, it is a cost of $300. It's one little vial, about a CC of air. So it's pretty expensive. Maybe it'll come down a little bit. This WH drill that we have here will irrigate at the same time. This is saline. We place the saline. Thank you. We now have a speaker going. We place saline from the refrigerator, sterile saline, and it actually pumps through the handpiece. And so when you use your high speed handpiece in the bone, you're, you're blowing everything around. But when you use it, one of these, it fills the area with a lot of uh, water, but there's no debris being blown around, including into your face and everything else. You, we use it for implants also. You can, you can uh, tailor it to what you want, new centimeters, etc. Dr. Chibato, who's with me now and has built my dental practice, uh, is an oral surgeon from Russia, and uh, he went back to Tufts, and now he practicing with me and the guy's amazing for some of the procedures that he can do uh, in office. Uh, they're trained as plastic surgeons. His PhDs in uh, cancer of the neck and radical neck surgery. Uh, he spent nine years in Moscow, the main hospital, and uh, in the United States. We have him here now. So his license and practice has a good practice for I suggest everybody should get a, uh, an instrument like this to be able to tell blood pressure, uh, the pulse and the oxygenation. So a pulse oximeter, some people go beyond it, put a blood pressure cuff on, you can buy it either way. This one is the most practical for us. And you can see here we have our tubing. Everything is sterile, and it's in here. You can sterilize the tubing. Everything is going to be coated, uh, covered with uh, sterile drapes. 
or assistance sign. Now, when Pete and I were doing this, Brobelman, who was a paradigmist, and when either we did it alone or we did it together, he's right-handed and I'm left-handed. And so we either assisted each other. Sometimes I couldn't see so well down on one side, he could see better, so he'd scrape out the debris and vice versa. So it was fun working together. It's fun working with another person who does the same thing. I like the loops. I like the light. I saw the light here that was very nice, uh, far less expensive and very functional. Um, it, it's, it's one of our people in the exhibition hall. Um, she has a lighting that you can wear and put on. She has her own loops, but these are designed for vision and the system that you can modify the other one for. I think this light's like two, three thousand dollars. The other's a lot less, bulbs are less, etc. So we're refining things. I've had that a long time. Here we are ready to do surgery. Uh, we're actually doing surgery. You can see how we blend into each other. Uh, Pete was my mentor at Penn. Uh, and he's a very fine paradigm. So here we have the first case. I was asked to show a simple case to start with. It's a 53-year-old uh, female whose problem is lying in this area. Now she was told by her naturopathic physician after he tested her uh, that she had a problem behind that molar and she should check it out. And so she came to see me. She's a patient of record. And we went ahead and I looked. And I really don't see that much. You can sort of see a ghost or a shadow in there. But when you're running through the bone ultrasound, you can see that it's stage three, and deserves having uh, surgery. If it's two or one, you may not do it unless there's symptoms. Her symptoms were minimal. So we're looking at it before we started. And I actually opened this up from the ascending rings to the mesial of the first molar, full flat, right along the crest of the ridge and along the first molar. Didn't want to lose any height because the crown is there. And here's our bow and here's our opening. And here we've opened it up with a, with a carbide burr. And here we're creating out a mixture of fatty tissue, greenish black, and bone. It goes down about a quarter of an inch or an inch. So we have here, we put the collagen into here, packed it, and we're suturing using a, a uh, football suture technique, continuous. And I also did one tie through the uh, interproximal between the molars. I also used micro. So if the patient doesn't come back in 21 days or so, it'll, it'll dissolve itself. And I won't have to worry about it. A lot of times you go in for black suture or you go in for suture and you go to cut that and you can't get out the rest of it. You don't have to worry about the vital. If you use gut, it usually opens up in six or eight days and it's too soon. You need that 14 to 15 days. I always bring the patient back in two weeks. And it, it, it really makes a difference. Seven days after surgery, the pathology report, regional ischemic osteoporosis, ischemic marrow damage. So, this is the cavitation six months later than the third bone ultrasound. And here we are, a temple in, in uh, China. Temple of Heaven, they will all get there someday. Um, I'll open things up for questions at this time. How am I doing for time? Just about five. Yeah? You don't use any burial pack when you're doing the whole flap in the institute? No. In about a day or two, it's attached. If you really, you have to open it in such a way with the, with the 15 blade. As a small one, you, you bring it along the attachment right at the crest between the tooth and the tissue. And when you flap that back, you bring it back all the way, it's clean. 
when you put it back, it just folds itself in. Perio pack, I think, is hard to clean for the patient. And as Phil pointed out, he's got this olive oil that's ozonated, and we're suggesting using olive oil to the patients. He's saying with this ozonated olive oil, he's having better results. So you don't get any infection on the suture area. You said using olive oil? Olive oil. Ozonated. Ozonated. Special stuff. Now, is that this rug? Are you saying just applying it to the topic loop? Yes, area, top, on top of the incision. Right. Okay. We were using oregano oil at one time, but yeah. the olive oil seems to do a better job when it's ozonated and it has certain healing properties. Yes, in the back. Um, for the first point, yes, mm -hmm. I've seen olive oils. Yeah. Just watch out yeah. that you might need to remove your sutures earlier. Uh -huh. Philip will also say to you, your healing process is enhanced such that if you only get the patient back 14 days later, if they actually got integration, cellular integration with your sutures, that you actually now need to tear new tissue formation to be able to get the tissues out, so the sutures out of the tissue. Okay, but what about if you use the micro, which dissolves itself uh, and gets assimilated into the tissue? So if you're going to use the olive oil technique, that's a good point. Make sure that you don't use black silk and, and have the patient uh, use the olive oil. I had, in the past, used uh, Billy Wolf's uh, old wolf gel because it has a lot of herbs in it, and it's out of aloe vera, and it works pretty well in promoting healing. Yes, Mike? Uh, also, uh, I don't know if anybody else is using colloidal silver. But the coital silver gels are working very well too. Love the ozone, and many times you may want to ozonate your water mm -hmm. and use that instead of hydrogen peroxide to clean the area. It does a wonderful job. Thank you. And I know that the ozonated machine is available also in the film uh, at, at, at the Yes, sir. Are you worried about the answer? Yeah. Uh, it's about 50. No, the handpiece is expensive. The whole apparatus is about fifty-four hundred dollars. But uh, Chibato put a uh, hundred implants, and he gave them two of them. All right, and, and life cool. He was giving them out with the implant. 